recording that is taking place right now. We're Are good? Are you ready? Uh, yes. Stand by. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, and so as I indicated before, my name is Vicki Gallen Clark. I'm the executive director of the Blue Hill Civic Association. We're also doing business as Building Hartford through community action. I'd like to personally welcome you to this historic event. But without further ado, what I would like to do is bring up Reverend um, Zachary Mullins, who is a senior pastor of the Phillips Metropolitan Church for our invocation. Pastor Mullins. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Phillips campus. We're so glad um, that this awesome organization has chosen this location to host such an amazing event. Let us pray. God, we thank you, praise you, and give you glory for allowing us to bear witness to yet another year. And God, we thank you that you've called us together for such a time as this in your divine wisdom. As the people of Hartford develop a choice, decide to make a decision, on who might lead them in the coming years. God, we ask not only that you bless uh, the citizens of Hartford, but also, oh God, that you bless these candidates, that you would empower them to speak truth, to share their vision. And God, we pray over their families and over them as they cultivate a vision for the future of this city. Now, God, bless the works of our hands on tonight and let it be successful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Zach. And so this is the very first mayoral forum that we are launching the new year with. A lot of people will say, isn't it early? It is early, but what we wanna do as a civic organization is bring the information to the people early. We wanna bring the information ongoing. And so what I'm going to tell you right now is our next forum is going to be in February at Weaver High School, our community hub. And the topic is public safety, public safety. So we're going to have a series of these throughout 2023. Again, our job as a civic organization is to bring you information and make sure that you have enough information to make an informed and intelligent decision. And so how do you do that? By asking your questions. Everybody should have a card. Tonight is going to be an introductory forum. We won't have a chance to do a deep dive in all the topics that are listed on your card. But I promise you, as we go to the subsequent months, that you will have a chance, since we're doing each forum, we'll have a specific topic to do your deep dive. If you need anything here tonight, I'm going to... If you need anything here tonight, you see folks around the room with the blue on the BHCA, just raise your hand and you will have individuals from our team who will be at your disposal. So we, again, wanna make sure that this is a comfortable environment, that's a safe environment for you to ask your questions. I am very excited because we have um, a dynamic moderator. Um, she knows the city, she's committed to the city, and that is none other than Attorney Cynthia Jennings. So Attorney Jennings will go over the ground rules for tonight. She will go over the time limits for tonight. Again, she has some questions that were already sent by residents, but we're gonna make sure we have some time for the Q&A at the end. Again, we're not going to have a chance to do a deep dive. This is an introductory session for you to get a chance to know more about the candidates who are sitting here. Next month, you will get notice. That's why we're getting your telephone number, your emails about the forum that would be held at Weaver High School, specifically focused on public safety. So Cynthia Jennings, I give the mic to you.
I want to thank Vicki Gallen Clark and the Blue Hills Civic Association for conducting this forum. It is critical that we get the information out to all of us early on and that people listen to what the candidates have to say and that you and you understand what the issues are in Hartford and who you want to support. I want to thank all the candidates for coming. It is a blessing to have so many candidates. I love to see people running for public office because it 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 makes it possible for us to share information on what the, the candidates' issues are and what their concerns are and what they plan to do and the skills that they bring to the job. So I'm asking everyone, they'll be opening with a two-minute um, introduction, but first I'm going to read the rules of engagement. And I'd like Angela to send me the copy of the questions or Adam to, to um, email the questions to me so that I can, I can go into the questions immediately after the rules of engagement. All right, first of all, the format for the evening. Each candidate will have two minutes for introductory comments. And Jody will be our our timekeeper. What are you going to do, Jody, when the time is up? The sun will go up. <laughs> and that means you're, you're, you have to wrap it up. So are you going to give them 30, minutes bef 30 seconds before, or are you going to wait until the two minutes is up and then just they can wrap it up with the last quest with the last statement? Or you know what? 30 seconds, give it, put it up. Okay. Thank you. Okay, 30 seconds, put it up, and then um, that means that they should finish their sentence and sit down. This one needs 30 seconds. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So each candidate has two minutes for introductory comments. The comments should talk about who you are, what your background and skills are, maybe if you've done something special and, and, and really come up with something that you've done special in the city of Hartford, maybe make that comment, and it should be, it has to be retained to, to two minutes, okay? But we want to know who you are when you finish and what you've done, okay? All questions will be posed by the moderator, which is me, Cynthia Jennings, and each candidate will have one minute to answer each question. So once we ask the question, or once I ask the question, then we're going to get one minute to start, to, to, to complete the question. I'm not going to always start with this end. I want, to, I want to alternate it so that we can start with the other end and come backward. Okay, so it's, it's going to go one, you're either going to be first or last. Okay, all right. And we'll start with Nick LeBron. Okay, all right. Now, if necessary, any rebuttal or follow-up comments will be limited to 30 seconds. A rebuttal will not be necessary unless somebody accuses somebody else of something that's incorrect and you want to you want to correct the statement without having violence involved. <laughs> so we're going to give you 30 seconds to rebut. If somebody lies on you, go ahead and, 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 and rebut. Okay, put your hand up. Or, and stop me. Don't let me go to the next one. All right. Questions from the audience will be collected by staff and consolidated by subject. Please print your questions clearly on the cards provided, and then limit your questions um, to each card, one question to each card. You are welcome to submit more than one question on separate cards, okay? All the questions are not going to be read because we're gonna end on, we might not start on time, but we will end on time, okay? The lights go out at 7.30. <laughs> All right, each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks. So once you do your opening remarks and all the questions are asked, if you feel like, if you candidates believe that you want to add something to the end, you get two minutes to close out, okay? All right, we will, we will stay on task and wrap up at 7.30 p.m. sharp. This is the first of a series, so remaining questions will, can be carried over to our next forum. And the next forum, like um, um, Ms. Clark said, will be on public safety strictly. That does not preclude qu on public safety questions tonight, but it also means that public safety issues will be done on an entire forum so that we have a, an opportunity to really get everything out and all the questions responded and answered to. Okay, and I'd like to start now with the, um, no, I'll wait. Yep, that's a good thing. That's right, they don't have to sit on the floor. Absolutely. Oh, that's the. <laughs> I know. 
And I want to just say thank you to the audience for being patient. Thank you for coming out in bad weather. Thank you for being interested in the city of Hartford. Your presence is a blessing. Um, Stan McCauley will be um, recording this. And maybe, um, Stan, you'd like to say when they will be able to view it again, if they will be able to, and how would they d go about doing that? Okay, he's live. Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll find out at the end. We'll share with everyone how to actually view the, um, the, um, the, uh, the recording for that we're taking today. Okay, and it is live as well. Okay, now I'd like to start out with opening remarks for each candidate. I'm going to start with Nick LeBron. We get two minutes each. Say your name. It's very important that people know who you are. Speak loudly. If you can't hear yourself, you can't be heard on the on the um, on the TV either. Testing one, two, three. Good. All right. So welcome everyone. I'd like to thank Blue Hill Civic Association uh, for hosting this tonight. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming here. You could be anywhere in the world, but you're here tonight because you're interested in the future of Hartford. I want to start my opening remarks and set aside some time. This morning, we lost a young person to gun violence on Broad Street. His name was Julius Rivera, Julius Rivera. And as I was speaking to a community leader and neighbor, she reminded me that this desensitized approach that we take because we're just starting to get used to it. And so she wanted me to take a moment to recognize Julius Rivera. So if we all can take a moment of silence for Julius Rivera and his family, I just want to take a couple seconds out of my time, um, Councilwoman. Thank you. So my name is Nick LeBron again, and I'm a community catalyst. I wear many hats and many hats of experience, 30 seconds. So I have a Hartford success plan, and I'm a Hartford success story, and you'll hear more about it tonight. But I thought it was more important to yield my time and a moment of silence for the continued violence that are happening in our community. Julius Rivera. Rest in peace. Okay, he'll be granted an extra minute. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. So, you know, I have a Hartford, uh, a, a plan for Hartford success. One that unites us as a city and every corner of this city one that is economically thriving, and one that is safe for us all. I have dedicated my life and am passionate about my city and have done multiple experience, and has multiple experience both in the Democratic Town Committee, as a lobbyist, and my heart is always as a community organizer. I'm currently on the city council and I'm looking at my timekeeper and I don't want to upset the timekeeper to start off because you guys run the show, so I'll uh, yield. Thank you so much for the extra minute. All right, thank you very much. All right, we'd like to move to the next um, individual. Please introduce yourself, and then to give you have a two-minute introduction. Is it on? There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Again, my name is Tracy Funny. I'm born and raised here in Hartford, Connecticut. And I know everyone here knows that we have a lot of issues to address. And of course, tonight is not going to be the time for that. But um, as Nick said, um, the gun violence. And my heart goes out to the family um, of the young man that we lost and to others that we have lost in the streets of Hartford. Um, through gun violence. So um, with that being said, I'm always out here in these streets and the fight is in the streets. 
Okay, I'm not a political individual, so I need you all to know that. I am coming here with this from my heart and the compassion that I have for my city to be safe, for them safe. Um, and that's pretty much all I can say right now at this point. But I'm here for the, run, the long haul, and I'm going to be here. So win or lose, I'm still going to be here, and I'm going to be in these streets. That's it. Thank you so much. Okay, like to move on to the next candidate. Okay, that would be Senator Von Farah. Thank you. Thank you. Pass it back down. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ms. Jennings, for uh, moderating t this evening, and um, thank you to Blue Hill Civic Association, Vicki Gowan Clark, for hosting us this evening, and thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to be here and caring about Hartford in this in this way. Um, I am John Fonfera, I'm a state senator currently representing the first senatorial district, which is about 60 something percent of Hartford, um, all of the South End, all of Frog Hollow, um, the East Side, uh, Parkville, um, most of downtown, and coming up on the East Side of, of, of Main Street to about Sand. Um, that, that includes my district. And I've been representing uh, the first senatorial district now for 26 years. I served 10 years before that in the House. Um, I've served 30 years with my dear, dear friend, uh, Eric Coleman. Um, we actually met prior to uh, being in the legislature. Um, I grew up, I'm a lifelong resident of Hartford, grew up in Rice Sites Housing Project um, until I was 15 years old. Um, never left Hartford. Uh, I'm a graduate of Hartford Public School System. And I've been working on behalf of uh, the residents of Hartford for all these years. I've given my life to public service. I've decided that um, while I feel I'm pretty effective or let other people decide that, um, but, but in terms of my role as chairman of the Finance Committee, being able to bring dollars back to Hartford and changing policies for the betterment of Hartford residents and our city, that being mayor, um, I could be more effective in that job and where the legislative, ro legislative role is indirect, being mayor is direct. It's every day, it's addressing the needs of our city. And I look forward to the opportunity to, to uh, share my vision as we go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And the next candidate we have is Renardo Dunn, Jr. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. You know, being a Hartford resident, you know, we have seen so many different things in the city of Hartford. You know, and I really strongly believe that the violence in Hartford really needs to stop. So we have to grasp everything of getting back our young people, letting our young people know we care. We are losing too many young people in the streets. Now is our time to say, you know what? We're gonna fight for you. You know, it's so many different things that can be fixed in the city of Hartford, but it's gonna take time. You know, I have talked to so many different people and just hearing the problems, hearing how they feel. You know, we need to let them know we hear you. You have a voice. You know, I, I can't say how many of you know Hartford matters. How much does it matter to you? Are we willing to make changes in Hartford? I yield my mic. Thank you. Dr. Dunn, I'm sorry, we did not have that. Dr. <laughs> Renardo Dunn, <laughs> thank you. And the next candidate will be um, Eric Coleman. 
Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. First thing I want to do is thank the Blue Hill Civic Association uh, for sponsoring this candidates forum and allowing me and my fellow candidates to share our information, our proposal, and our vision for Hartford. I also want to thank all of you uh, for being here uh, and participating this evening. I am extremely hopeful that uh, most, if not all of you, are aware of who I am. My name is Eric Coleman, and I've devoted uh, more than half of my life to public service. And that public service oftentimes took the form of uplifting people and empowering communities. Uh, I'm fortunate that I've had many, many opportunities uh, to perform service. And uh, I perform service as a legal aid or a legal services lawyer, as a public defender, and as an attorney in private practice. But beyond that, I had the honor of representing this community as a state representative and as a state senator. And most recently, uh, I served in the role of Superior Court Judge. I believe uh, that I was elected and reelected uh, over a period of 18 years when I was in the legislature, uh, 18 times when I was in the legislature because uh, people had a positive view of my character, of my integrity, and of my trustworthiness, as well as my know-how and my ability to get things done. So I'm looking forward uh, to continuing public service. During the time that I was in the legislature, I was involved in the passage of some major legislation, including the repeal of the death penalty, uh, an act concerning the excessive use of force by law enforcement, uh, I've been involved in civil rights matters, uh, including uh, same-sex marriage. And I was also uh, one of the co-sponsors of the bill that required all the municipalities in the state of Connecticut to recognize Martin Luther King Day as a state holiday. I want to serve uh, as the mayor of the city of Hartford because I believe all of that experience uh, can be brought to bear in order to move Hartford forward. Uh, those are just some of the issues uh, that I think uh, will be discussed this evening, and I look forward to that discussion. Thank you. And then the final candidate for the two-minute introduction will be Arunan, Arunapan. I'm probably killing your last name. Say your name again, please. Arunan Arulampalam. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Say, Ar it slowly, Ar say it slowly so people can hear you. Arunin Arulampalam. But feel free to call me Arunin if that's tough. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for being here. It's, it's incredible to see this many people in a room uh, to talk about the mayor's race at what I think is a really important time. Uh, the, uh, the pastor that sat, talked, you know, referenced that line from Esther, such a time as this. I think it's a really important time in our city. Um, you know, th I, I, my name's Arunin. I'm, I'm a dad. Uh, to five young kids. I'm a husband and I'm a resident of one of our neighborhoods in Hartford. Uh, actually, I live not far from um, that young man who was shot. So thank you, Nick, for um, for taking that moment of silence. I appreciate that. Um, and I think from, from our neighborhoods in Hartford, you get a really different perspective of the city. You know, you see a lot of the pain, you see the impact of disinvestment in our neighborhoods. Um, but for me, I also see a lot of the potential of our city. I think this is a beautiful city, and I believe in the future of Hartford because I believe in the people of Hartford and what the people can do with opportunities and with a champion. Um, and that's what I've tried to do in my career at the at the Department of Consumer Protection, where I was deputy commissioner. Um, I fought to try to expand opportunities for minorities to get into the building trades. I fought uh, against one of the biggest slumlords in the city of Hartford, Emmanuel Koo, and we instituted a, the first of its kind in the nation lawsuit against him. I fought to ensure that cannabis dollars uh, from the state would come back into disinvested communities like this one right here um, because I believed in building wealth among people in this city and that's what I've tried to continue to do at the Hartford Land Bank. We, you know, we've taken an organization um, that was set up to work on redevelopment which is such an important uh, task in our city to deal with blighted properties but to do it in a way that built wealth by training Hartford residents to do that redevelopment 
to, to empower communities and to, to invest in the people who live here to transform communities from within using our own residents. And that's what I believe in. We have so much power and so much potential if we can harness the ability, the potential of the people who are, live in this city, who breathe in the city, who work in the city, and who sweat for the city. And, and I believe in this city because I believe in all of you. So I appreciate uh, you guys being here. I'm excited to talk to you about my ideas for this city. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to reverse the flow and start again with Arunin. And he's going to be the one who's, who gets the first question. And the first question is, if elected, what three steps would you take to improve the quality of life for residents in our city and to provide job opportunities and training for our youth? Uh, let's start with quality of life. Uh, you know, I, we, we don't talk about housing in terms of um, the, the powerlessness so many residents have over their housing options. Um, you know, we have the lowest home ownership rate in the entire state of Connecticut. We've got a 24% home ownership rate, which means that over three quarters of our entire city is at the mercy of landlords, too many of whom live outside of the state of Connecticut. In this neighborhood right here, the majority of landlords, uh, over 60% of landlords, live outside of the state of Connecticut and have no interest in making investment in, into the properties of the people who live here. And so we need a city that is going to take the, the use the tools we already have to go after some of those slumlords who are, are making money off of folks who are living in substandard housing with, with broken down roofs and, and rats in their, in their city. We have the tools to go after them. Um, and as your mayor, I would, I would go after them. I would try to take their properties. I'll work with the state to try to uh, take their wealth. Um, we've got to deal with housing in a serious way. Um, we've got to we've got to think about um, building out a pipeline of folks in the construction trades. There there's so many opportunities in the construction trades, and and we are working through the land bank and through other organizations to redevelop properties. Why don't we have our own apprenticeship school here in Hartford? To, to I'm going over time, aren't I? Yes, okay. you are. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, and I've been asked to to ask all the candidates to please talk closer to the mic. If you can't hear yourself loud and clear, neither can the, the, can, can the audience or the cameras. So improving the quality of life of residents. You're too of far away from the, the um, mic. Is this better? Yes, that's okay, much so better. Thank you. Um, the, th the three things that I would uh, do in order to improve the quality of life of uh, Hartford residents, um, there's a mosaic that has to be woven. I think those three things have to do with public safety uh, education and job creation in order to improve uh, the quality of life of Hartford residents. So as far as public safety is concerned, I know we'll get into this uh, much more deeply uh, at the next forum, but uh, the police department has to be reformed to a certain extent. Uh, we're understaffed as far as the police department is concerned. We have to bring that number up to about 600 police officers. Not all of them have to wear uniforms, but I think that would be the optimum number uh, of police officers for the city of Hartford. As far as education is concerned, uh, the teachers in Hartford have to be relieved of some of the overly burdensome administrative responsibilities so that they can spend more time with students, instructing students, uh, and in the classroom teaching students. Also, um, there are some students who are viewed as disruptive and I think they have to be removed from the classroom, but Time I'm not up. in favor of suspension or expulsion. All right, thank you, Madam mm -hmm. Barger. Okay. All right, same question to you, Doctor. The three things. had originally okay. all right so the three things that I'm gonna focus on you know it's pretty much the crime you know also our school system not only that we also have a lot of homeless 
in the city of Hartford. Homelessness has a rise so heavy in Hartford. So now we have to build a foundation to control all these different things. And as your mayor, you know, I'm going to make sure our police department is well taken care of. You know, our school system is well taken care of. Even going out there making sure we don't have a lot of homeless people on the streets. Especially in these times now, it's cold. So it's time to make a difference. Okay. Thank you very much. And we'll move on. Keep coming down the road. Thank you. Um, they say that uh, a good predictor of where you want to go is where you've been. And I'd like to share with you in my time where I've been in terms of the issues that you've asked in terms of quality of life and job creation safety. I uh, fought for and received $10 million from the state for a new uh, uh, library on Park Street, which is, if you've seen it, it's a beautiful building and available to all, including the children of that neighborhood. A five, I established a five-year, $25 million program for HEDCO and SAMA, uh, the largest minority small business loan organizations in the state, including in right in this neighborhood that HEDCO has invested on Albany Avenue, on, on, uh, on, on uh, Main Street, uh, uh, and so on. A million dollars, $500,000 each for Park Street and Albany Avenue, and the Albany Avenue site will be opening soon for a walk-in manufacturing facility. So someone from the neighborhood doesn't have to go out of town, but it's right in their neighborhood. The Park Street facility is open currently. And the Albany Avenue site will be in the Colin Bennett building, so look for it. I hope you will and share that with your friends. Worked for, for, with um, Senator, er, Senator uh, McCrory uh, to obtain $7 million for the renovation of the Quirk Middle School. Oh, my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got shut off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Hello. See you ready? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we'll go to um, uh, Ms. Funny. What I would do, two minutes. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody is covering this topic, all right? We already know the safetyness is number one, okay? Housing is two. Um, but no one is talking about getting the community involved, the actual residents that live here where the issues and problems are. Um, I have a project that's called Beat the Streets of Hartford, and that came from Walking Beat when I was growing up. Um, I just flipped it, Beat the Streets of Hartford, meaning I be out there in those streets. And what I see that I dislike, I'm pretty sure y'all dislike it as well because I post a lot on Facebook. So, um, like I said, everything we're doing is about the community. The city of Hartford, I love Hartford. I'm born and raised here. So there's nothing I wouldn't do for myself, my children, my grandson, and my family. Of course, my friends and community. I'm good. Because I can keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate your time. Okay. So, so Councilwoman, it's one minute. Is yes, that, is one that? minute for okay. the answer the question. Okay. Solve all the problems in one minute. You know, I'm going to take a different route because I believe it was quality of life, job opportunities, and youth, right, in that order. Mm -hmm. And I will say, in order to solve the problems of our future or to begin to, we have to do it in reverse order. It's hard to figure out a plan when you're in the middle of a fire. And there is things that are happening that we are on fire. So as a background, and my background as a family therapist and in human services, we believe in prevention. And so we have to focus on the youth first because they are our future. And we have to establish that. And I have experience over 20 years saving lives and teaching young people and being a mentor in various programming. I have gotten millions of dollars for children's education, have changed the children's behavioral health system, all by community organizing, all from the power of the people and the power of you.
Thank you. All right, now we're going to start again with another economic engine and tract of land that's huge in the city of Hartford. The question is for each one of you, number one, do you support the closure of Brainerd Airport? And if yes, what would you put in its place? And if no, I mean, if, if you support the closure, and if you do not support the closure, why not, and what would you support that airport be utilized for? So, Councilwoman, you're going to give me that hard question first? That was an easy question. So, here's the thing, right? So, Councilwoman Jennings is a tireless advocate for the environment mm -hmm. and always has been. So, thank you for your dedicated service in that arena. Thank you. Yeah, clap it, clap it up, clap it up. <laughs> Thank you. But that don't count against my one minute, right? No, no, that doesn't go. No, that doesn't go towards your one. Minute. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so as I look here, there's some folks that are very emotionally charged here about the airport. What I'll start with is myself and partnership with Senator Fonfera here. Um, I was able to galvanize community voice to talk about what the airport means in our community. Now, for me, we have to revisit and revisit the thought around 30 people utilizing a space that's double the size of downtown. We got 30 planes down there. Now, one would argue that there's multiple business and so much potential in the future. But we are on fire right now. And you're gonna hear that theme right now. And we need change right now. And the promises of the airports started before I was born and started when I was an apple in my father's eye. And we still waiting for it to be profitable. Now, what I would say is we don't want things to go there if we can't build there. So right now, Senator Fonfera, thank you, and, uh, and, and, and we partnered on this is to do a study there to see if we can actually build on that land because no one wants to build on a land that is hazardous. Thank okay, you. so my question is, was that a yes or a no? <laughs> so yes or no to... Whether you, would you keep the airport open? No, I don't think a, a playground for 30 people outweighs the value of our entire city. Okay, thank you, that was, okay. Can we have the next the next candidate, Ms. Funny? Mm -hmm. You gotta get closer, we can't hear you. All right, I'm just not hearing about this. So um, all I can say about that airport is keep it closed until somebody can come about and do something with it. Because like I said, I'm just not hearing about that airport. Okay, so that is uh yes, you would keep it open? Or close. You would close Close, it. close. Okay, all right. Next candidate, please. Uh, sir. Thank you. Senator Fanfara. Thank you. Uh, for those that don't know, um, there's no question about my position regarding the airport. It, it, it should close, but I, I, I did not take that approach in putting something before the legislature. The, pre the property is 200 acres in the south end on the Connecticut River, historic river being used by about 100 pilots who come from out of town that like to drive a short a few miles to park their car, get in a plane, drive to Nant fly to Nantucket or the East the New Jersey shore and pay very little, almost nothing to the state of, to the city of Hartford. And that airport is a, frankly, a recreational opportunity for some fairly well off people to benefit from that and they don't want to go to Bradley because they pay a lot more. They don't want to go somewhere else. So they, they have fought vita, uh, mightily to keep the airport open. Despite we could create jobs there, we create uh, businesses there, we could have recreation for all of your children to go and enjoy the Connecticut River where very rarely from, from uh, Enfield to Saybrook can you. This study will reveal the, reveal the answer come next October what the value of that property is as it is today as an airport versus what it could be in terms of uh, recreational opportunities, businesses, and what have you. We'll know the answer then. Uh, a, a very strong yes to close the airport, yes. Thank you. And Dr. Um, Dr. Dunn? All right. 
Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just like Tracy said, I'm just aware now hearing about this. But I would say keep it closed until we can find what to do with it. Okay, thank you. Eric Coleman. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No. Move the mic close. Okay. And somebody give him a working mic. <laughs> Testing, one, two, one, two. <laughs> Am I heard? No. Hello? Here. I think somebody got a charger for these mics. <laughs> okay, it looks like it's on. I can be heard now? Okay, yes, great. Yes, talk great. close. So, um, I'll take a different view. I think the airport uh, should not be closed. As a matter of fact, I think it should be enhanced. There's a lot of uh, short-sightedness. In my view, uh, there's a lot of potential in the airport. Um, people, uh, I think it's easy to create the narrative that uh, it's a playground for wealthy people. I don't think all of that is true. There's a lot of activity that's taken place at the airport, in, including uh, aviation schools and training that our young people could take advantage of uh, some of the some of the jobs uh, that are being trained for at the airport uh, are very well-paying jobs so seventy thousand dollars a year and up and the training apprenticeships that could occur uh, at Brainerd <laughs> Airport for many of our young people could result in very lucrative careers in the aeronautics industry uh, I don't think we should take that lightly. There's a lot of potential in that airport, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, the remediation costs would uh, support the uh, kind of development that other people are talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Ruman. Yeah, so I, I think the way we're approaching this question, with all due respect to the moderator, is, is part of the problem with our politics here, for that we, we should have to come in with a hardened view on something without ever having a community conversation, without ever bringing people to the table. Look, Senator Fonfara has gotten money from the state to do a study. Let's read the study, let's go in front of the community, let's talk to people about what they wanna see. You know, as, as, as CEO of the Lane Bank, whenever we get a property, I personally, as CEO, walk around with a one block radius, knock on every door, and asked residents, what do you want to see here? What would you like to see in your neighborhood? And this continued focus, this emphasis on each of us out of our great wisdom, uh, coming in with, with a, a hardened view on everything, without bringing community into conversations on redevelopment, and into conversations on what we do with large tracts of land in our city, I think is, is so why so many people feel so disconnected from this process. We've got to bring people to the table. We've got to lean on the wisdom within the whole city, Time within the community, up. within the village, and we've got to listen to people and, and start to put people first. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, the, wait, we need to, a yes or no from you on whether you, what would you, would, whether you would keep the airport open or not. <laughs> I think it's a bad question. Okay, That's my answer. What's your answer? That it's a bad question. I okay. think I think I think it's set up a, a, a bad form of politics within our system, and I, I I think it's a bad question. My my answer is I would have a real conversation about it, and I would listen to people. Of uh, to I mean uh, the the idea that we can't listen to people before a mayor makes up their mind on something, before we as a community make up our mind okay. on something, is exactly what's wrong with our politics. Okay. All right. Okay, so we're going to take that time off your next question. No, we're not. I have 30 seconds. Okay. 30 seconds, Madam. Madam All right. I'm, um, hold on. Um, yes, you can, have a, uh, you can have a 30-second rebuttal, but there's a follow-up question to the airport issue. All right. Sure. Go ahead. Me first? Yes. yes. So um, I, I think there's a lot of uh, supposition that there have not been studies regarding this issue. There have been studies. This, this matter has been talked about since uh, 2016, probably earlier than that. Probably the discussion started in 2006. So it's not uh, that we're coming new to this. As a matter of fact, the study in 2016 said the best and most economic, uh, economically feasible use for that space, for that land, was as an airport. 
Okay. Uh, we also overlook the fact that there's civil aeronautics, homeland security, uh, civil air patrol that are using that airport. FAA and the CAA are not going to close that airport lightly. Thank you. All right. And um, Nick LeBron, you had a... Um yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to just throw a key word out there called tokenization. So what I saw was when we talked about closing the airport, they paraded this young man, this young man of color from Hartford, as, oh, there's students from Hartford here. So I said, okay, let me give it a chance. Let me go visit. So I went to go see. First, they didn't let me in. Second, they didn't let me in. Third, I met with a team. And fourth, I finally got in the janitors. Janitors run the show in a lot of places. And when I looked at those students, they did not look like us. And so we can't be promised the potential of tomorrow when we are on fire today. Okay. Thank you. Now the follow-up question starts down with Arunan. Okay, the follow-up question on that is, on Christmas Eve, Southwest Airport closed down 80% of their flights. And the reason was because we have an international pilot shortage. So knowing that there's an international pilot shortage, do you support Hartford residents being trained to become pilots and, 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 and aircraft mechanics, making over $100,000 a year to start? That's the question. Do you support Hartford residents becoming pilots? Yeah, look, at, at, as long as we have an airport, I think I think it makes sense. I, I think any any training program that's going to get jobs for Hartford residents, we've got to support. All right. We started on the wrong end, dude. No, that was no, that we were supposed to start at that end. I'm sorry. So, I also uh support Hartford residents getting jobs as pilots, but there are other jobs. There are uh, jet engine mechanics positions that people can be trained for that are um, equally as high paying as, as the pilot's positions are. Okay. Thank you. All right, doctor. Um, I support it as well. The reason why I support it is any jobs that we can bring to Hartford residents is a positive and, you know, motivation to Hartford. Thank you. Senator? There we go. Um, I emphatically support uh, training uh, our folks for to become a pilot, a mechanic. That school is there at Brainerd because I worked to get it there many years ago when it was in Wyndham and they weren't able to get enough people to participate. And it came and we, and we got the money to build it in Hartford. There's no connection to that facility and the airport, none. That facility can be anywhere in Hartford or anywhere else for that matter. Um, uh, but there's no relationship to the airport in that facility. And unfortunately, despite efforts to, there hasn't been any attempt to connect that school in the Hartford school system or anyone else. There are very, you know, very few people in Hartford who know that that's there. Thank you. Yes, I support all residents of Hartford to get that job and any job they go for um, if they have the opportunity to get it. So absolutely, I support that. Thank you. So I won't waver and I'll say yes, right? I think anyone here would want opportunities. And going back to the further question, because they're interconnected, that's the second piece. That's the job opportunity piece. But I think what we have to realize and what we have to look at is what is the bridge to these job opportunities? Just because they exist don't mean we have access. So what I plan to do to be the future mayor is to be that bridge and provide that access no matter where it is. I've done most, okay, all right. I don't want to upset the uh, moderator, but okay. Thank you. All right, no rebuttal on any of that. And for those of you who did not answer the question, the question was, 
do you support Hartford residents being trained? Well, let me just, I'll preface it with, there are many states that train their young people as young as 14 years old, and by the time they're 17, they have their FAA license. The question is, do you support training Hartford youth to become pilots and fly and, 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 and live up to their dreams and potential? Yes. Thank you. And did you change your position on keeping the airport open when you answered that question? <laughs> I knew, Councilwoman uh, uh, Jennings, that, that we're interconnected, right? Okay. But I think those are two different things. One of the things is that I've done here, right here at Milner, is that I created job access programs and job training programs. And what we did was we, we take the kids and we bring them to the trucks, right? So they're not, it, they're not mutually inclusive. It's not a zero-sum game. You can do both. You can have redevelopment with the promise of tomorrow so that we can address the perpetual poverty that continues to exist in our neighborhoods. And we can double that by providing access to more resource, by utilizing a space that's twice the size of downtown with access to the riverfront and train young people to be pilots and follow their dreams. All right. And my question is, do you think that our city is healthy, successful, and economically um, supportive of our residents and our youth? And I'll start with you, Mr. LeBron. Ari, can you uh, repeat that one more time? Sure, do you think that our city is healthy and successful and provides economic opportunities for our youth and our residents? No. It's on fire. <laughs> we cannot, it's hard to like, we, you know, in trauma, when you talk about behavioral health and social work, right? It's hard to talk about like paying the rent and working on goals when you about to be homeless. Right? So these are the same things. And we have to address the root causes as prevention. Prevention is the best mechanism. And I will stay on that. And I will always be on that. And all of us need access, the same equal access that other people in different neighborhoods have access to. We need access everywhere. And I, when I become mayor, I will fight for access for everybody. Okay, thank you. Ms. Funny, can you talk about whether or not you think our city is healthy and successful in terms of economics for our children and for our adults, our, our residents, and what would you do to change that? No, no, and no. <laughs> okay. Um, like I said, I'm out there. To the I'm mic. sorry, guys. Thank you. I'm out there. So, um, <sighs> wow. This is a question that two minutes is not gonna get it, but um, just no, no, and no. And as the mayor of my city, and I'm gonna say my city, because I'm from here and I live here, um, the job will get done. The job isn't done and it hasn't been done. That's why we're where we at right now. That's why I'm sitting at this seat <laughs> right now because the job has not been done. So um, we need changes, a lot of them. Thank you. All right, Senator Fanfara. Well, I think that there are a lot of people who are working hard in Hartford to make us a healthy city and a prosperous city and where there is opportunities. But the forces of poverty are so overwhelming um, right outside across the street from here is, an, is a census tract that has approximately 40% of its population lives below the poverty line, 40%. And with that, which is considered concentrated poverty, comes every uh, characteristic that you can think of, underperforming schools, higher crime, uh, unemployment, as I said, low income. We have to raise the income of Hartford residents. That is prior, has to be priority one, raising the income of Hartford residents. It also inc involves 
it also involves it also involves um, uh, not requ not expecting that the Hartford school system is going to be solely responsible for the education of our children. A ch we act as if a child is born at five years old and goes into kindergarten. We have five years, the most important years of a child's <coughs> life, and we as a city should embrace that every child will walk into kindergarten ready. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Dr. Dunn? You know, to, to answer that question, no, we're not. Hartford is not. We, we, first of all, we need to have community. We need to reach our community. Again, I, I can't stress it enough. Let our community know that we care. Let the Hartford residents know that they matter. Because right now, the route that is going with our youth is not good. You know, me being a single dad, you know, I, I live it every day. Mm -hmm. I, I see it. It's not easy for us. It's not easy. But in order to do certain things, first of all, we're going to have to let our kids know we can't let them drop out anymore out of school. We have too many dropouts in the school system. It's time to bring more jobs back to Hartford, to rebuild Hartford. And as your next mayor, I, I, I'd say this, we're gonna rebuild Hartford, make Hartford to what it needs to be, and we're gonna thrive to let everyone know that you matter. Thank you. All right. Eric Coleman. Thank you. So. Uh, Hartford is not a healthy city, and people are not thriving in Hartford as a crew. Hold on, we can't hear you. That mic is too far away. Is this better? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm saying Hartford is not a healthy city. Th people and residents of Hartford are not thriving as they should be, and that's because uh, the neighborhoods have been neglected. Evidence that Hartford is not thriving and is not a healthy city uh, is the declining population in Hartford. There has been a lot of investment and a lot of development in the downtown sector of Hartford. There's been an absence of development and investment in the neighborhoods. That has to occur. Small businesses have to be nurtured. They are probably the ones that are going to hire or are more likely to hire the residents of that neighborhood where the small business is located. Development projects could revolt, uh, result in jobs. Infrastructure improvements could also result in jobs for residents of the neighborhoods. Uh, there are a lot of things that have to occur, uh, but job creation and uh, support and investment in the neighborhoods is one of those things that could make Hartford healthier. Okay, thank you. All right, and Arunin. Yeah, from a very literal standpoint, Hartford is not healthy, right? People in this neighborhood have a life expectancy that's 14 years less than people just a mile away, which means that the system is willing to steal 14 years of your life, and, and we've done so little to deal with it. We have a, a joblessness rate, an unemployment rate that's at Great Depression levels, and for those of you who've read about the Great Depression, you know that when that happened in white communities, the, the country re reacted in a completely different way and mobilized and put everything they can, could to, to turn that around. And so you know, when, when we think about Hartford, I think we've got to build our own systems of success. I, I, I dream of a Hartford that doesn't look to somewhere on the outside to pull in investment, but looks to our own residents who have all the potential to be great and successful right here. And so I'll, I, I can't tell you all of my plans with, with the few seconds I have left, but I'll tell you one thing I want to do. We're going to get cannabis tax revenue soon when, the, when those establishments open. And we don't get new revenue in the city all that often. I want to create a dedicated fund with that revenue to leverage state dollars, state cannabis dollars, and corporate dollars to allow for Hartford residents to have capital to buy homes or start businesses in formerly redlined neighborhoods to build our own levels, to build our own mechanisms of success right here in the city. Thank you. Now, we're, I think we started with, you, we started with Nick LeBron last time, so we start with you this time. Uh, my question is, what would you do as mayor to bring in jobs and economic opportunities in the area of contractors, small contractors, small businesses, 
uh, minority contractors, lawyers, teachers, doctors, and other professions that would allow our children to have an opportunity and have hope for their future. Yeah, let's. We'll start with contractors. You know, it, with something that I've already been doing at the Land Bank, which is investing in creating a pipeline of folks in this city who can eventually become the developers of tomorrow, who can take on properties, redevelop them, and build wealth while we are reinvesting and rebuilding, uh, rehabbing our city. Um, and I'd like to do that and and expand that into a training uh, program, an apprenticeship program for contractors in the cities that give pathways for uh, kids coming up who who may not. Not, uh, have college as an option, but but can go into uh, being a, a plumber, a pipe fitter, an electrician, and make a six-figure income while building wealth right here in this city. You know, I, I I think we've gotta we've gotta have a really robust response to the joblessness, and and I'd like to create a job center that co coordinates and 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 consolidates all of the resources from the nonprofits, various nonprofits working on joblessness, so people have a one-stop shop they can walk into and get and get connected to job training programs, get connected to employment, get connected to the services that are out there to ensure that we turn around our an unemployment rate. And I see my time's up, but thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? No, please move it closer. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, so um, as mayor, I would require that every contract for every developer, every vendor, uh, and every contractor be rewritten so as to require uh, not only the set aside, but uh, for every developer to have a hiring requirement, uh, apprenticeship or training program so that young people uh, can be brought on to any and every project that is uh, sponsored by the city uh -huh. in order to put them in a position so that they would have uh, an opportunity to actually gain uh, hands-on experience, uh, whether it be in contracting, uh, in any kind of business that could serve as a developer, uh, any procurement opportunities that the city uh, is involved in. Uh, we need to uh, make certain that the operation of our $600 million uh, city operation uh, is profitable as well for uh, the residents of Hartford and particularly young people in the city of Hartford. Thank you. As, as your next mayor, I'm going to make sure that with, these co with the contracting that our youth will be able to have apprenticeships where they can go to school, learn these different trades, similar like what Job Court has. You know, on the job training, that's what we need to bring back to our youth and for the city of Hartford, on the job training. You know, it's, it's time to show the thriveness for Hartford. And any investments, anything that we can do to stop the poverty, it's time to do it. Thank you. Um, this is hard work. You know, we can, we can establish a program, and I've seen many of them, and they don't produce the results that we want. And the, the watchword is intentional. Are you intentional in having an outcome that you seek? Um, the Colin Bennett uh, program, I'm, I'm sorry, the Police Athletic League program I spoke to earlier, Quirk Middle, that with Blue Hill Civic Association put young people to work as apprenticeship in doing the renovation of that building. There were people who got jobs from that in training. Uh, two years ago when, when the uh, storm Isis came through and power went out in Hartford and Doug McCrory said, to, Senator McCrory said to me, the, you know, the linemen came through and, and none of the people looked like us. And I said, let's do something about that. And I found that Eversource has a program in New Hampshire uh, with a community college training apprentices in being a lineman. Today there's a program at Capital Community with Eversource training people to be a, a apprentice, a apprenticeship linemen. It, you have to be intentional and do the work. Thank you. All right, Ms. Funny. Okay. Hmm. Me being a mirror. 
me being a mayor. Wow. <laughs> what I would do is invest in our city all around. All the financing that the city of Hartford get will automatically go to our youth and training programs. Um, there are a lot of us out there, as far as youth, that can benefit off of jobs that they're not able to get. So training would definitely be one of my things I would do. The whole works of being the mayor of the city of Hartford is to take care of the city of Hartford. And that's what I would just do, just take care of the city of Hartford. No matter what area it is, everyone would be taken care of. Thank you. All right, Nick LeBron. So Councilwoman Jennings, uh, you know, I get passionate about youth, so I'm gonna take off my jacket because it's starting to get warm in here. <laughs> We're on fire. <laughs> Yeah. You got 30 seconds left. That 30 seconds. <laughs> so what I will do is start with, now, so what I will say is I won't start with what I will do, but what I have done. So currently the resolution that uh, currently, uh, I changed the resolution and the policy that currently exists for the city of Hartford because immediately on the first day on the job, I passed by a construction site and there are people that don't look like us on those sites. So I immediately put a resolution in place that's currently in place today and we're starting to see benefits. What I will say in terms of access for, ch uh, for our youth is the exposure to trades. Right now up the street in this uh, same community at Milner School, the children are learning plumbing. They're learning truck driving. They're learning how to be security guards. They're learning how to be phlebotomists. They're learning how to do an exposure to trades that we never had access to. So again, the two-prong approach, the resolution for the policy and the investment in the future. Okay, thank you. And now we'll, I'm sorry, we're gonna move on to the next question. There are summer youth programs that are currently being um, run in our city where our children are given a stick with a nail at the end so they can go in the parks and pick up the trash, put them in black plastic bags, and keep it moving. What, do you, what is your position on having every single department in the city of Hartford train their young people, have interns in, those, in, in every department, train these young people to run these departments, to manage these departments, and give, allow them to have opportunities so that they can be the next generation of people that actually, actually run the city of Hartford. And if in, in addition to your position on that, I'd like to know how you plan to implement that. Well, Councilwoman Jennings, you and I speak the same talk a lot and often, and I'm always very, um, uh, hold you in high esteem for your passion and have been for a while. And so what I will say is this, is that the trash and all of that other stuff, I say about the apprenticeship, it's like, let's do it. But the question is, is like, not just let's do it, is the implementation is the more important piece. Oftentimes, policies get made, ribbons get cut, people get pats on the back, and they walk away. And how we deliver those services don't come to fruition. So we have to be able to operationalize in an effective way and not just chase after ideas. We have to have ideas to follow through so we can give them what they rightly deserve. Thank you. Okay, the question is, Right now in Hartford, the summer youth programs, the kids are given a stick and a nail and, a lot and told to pick up garbage in the parks, okay? Instead of doing that kind of a summer program, what is your position on having our children put in every single department in the city of Hartford and trained to run the city of Hartford? Mm. And how do you intend to operationalize that as mayor? 
I support that 1,000%. Um, growing up, I was doing that at eight years old in our summer programs when we was coming up as children. So I, I support that 100%. And what would I do? <laughs> wow. More training and more training and more training. Thank you. I think anything that provides exposure for our children, um, many of the kids of Hartford don't get the op they don't have an uncle who works at Pratt and Whitney. They may not have uh, uh, someone in their family or a neighbor that can provide a summer job that then leads to an, um, a permanent job once they're done with school. And so I think the city, uh, the mayor, uh, the city government, the private sector can do so much more in terms of introducing opportunities. Exposure is huge. And just being able to open the eyes. There are, there are kids that drive by on their bicycles, Aetna, and, and they think that world is not for them. They drive by the Capitol and they think that world is not for them. And that is just so uh, limiting to our kids in what the, their opportunities can be and how to get there. And, and I would think that we could do so much more from the city in terms of facilitating those relationships if we're intentional, if we're intentional. And I don't know if we always are. It's, it's my time is up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. And Dr. Dunn, you're next. Yes, I support it. But also, I do believe that we should give them an opportunity. Say, hey, come look at this. See if you like this. You know, let them know that there's different things, you know, because and, 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 when you look at politics, you think about all these different type of nonsense, as some people will call it, you know, but they not understanding the real definition of what these jobs entail. So we have to train, train, show them this is better. We can do better, you know, better and let them know you got this. Thank you. Wait, we can't hear you, Mr. Coleman. <laughs> I can't hear me either. Now okay, I can move that mic so, closer. Um, whether it be by executive order or some other uh, act by the mayor's office, I would require every department to make opportunities available to young people. Mm -hmm. Not only with the city departments, but with uh, those corporations that are doing business with the city, um, those corporations where uh, the treasurer is investing money, I think uh, a, a good return uh, in addition to the financial return would be requiring those corporations to provide certain job opportunities for our young people so our young people could be exposed and learn and make a little money to support themselves and their families. Thank you. All right, Mr. Ruman. Yeah, I, I support um, having having my uh, division heads do that. But also, uh, as as I think uh, John said earlier, you know, going to folks I know in the governor's office and each of the commissioners across the state and each of the constitutional officers and people in in the LOB and then going to the travelers in Aetna and and the Hartford and saying to them if you really care about the city if you really believe in this city then invest in giving our kids some place that they can dream where they can dream of a future beyond their what they see day to day I think it's so important to give kids the, the vision of what they can be because every kid growing up in this community has that potential and I want them to dream about it and I want them to find mentors along the way in these corporations and, and, and at, within our state legislature who can be help them guide them in that career who, who might not have look I growing up I didn't have any connections I didn't I didn't I didn't have that network built in um, and it was so hard to go out and find it and I want kids growing up in this city to have all of the opportunities that we can give them to be just like kids growing up in glass Bury or Simsbury or anywhere else instead. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to come down to Nick LeBron and we're going to say, how would you enforce every department 
and every contractor that is getting money from the city of Hartford, how would you enforce them um, to take our children in and make them apprentices or interns and have them learn from those, those businesses how to run a business and how to run the city? Well, first we have to look at the current policy and understand why it doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work, because it has no teeth. Right now, when folks begin construction projects, they already know the fine, and they just write the check. It's a part of their budget. So we can't continue to do that. We have to find leverage opportunities with teeth. And that, you know, it's the stick and the carrot. You know, you don't always have to use the stick. Maybe there are opportunities with a carrot where we can partner with them and create situations where they would want young people to be apprentices. The investment in our children and the investment in our future is the key. And anybody who does business here, if they don't believe that, they could do business somewhere else. Okay. And I guess my question is what you got to, and that is, would you shut a job down and stop the city money from going into these contractors who continue to use our cities and take our tax dollars? So, uh, that's me, right? Are you asking me? No, you already <laughs> said you would, you would do enforcement. But you can, you can rebut if you want to add later. So I have and I will. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, shut them down. <laughs> shut them down, clean it up, and get somebody up in there that's going to do right for our youth. That's what I'm here for. That's what got me here, is the youth. The Department of Family and Children's and Family Recreation. That's why I'm here, for the youth. And so yes, I will shut everybody down. <laughs> shut them down. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't think that that's um, necessarily productive. I think that uh, you know establishing relationships with contractors that you want to this uh, exposure and and training and apprenticeships to happen. I think you'll you'll get a lot of participants. Um, I'll, I'll just say we have Prince Tech in our own backyard here. The city of Hartford has never embraced that school ever, and if there ever were an opportunity to introduce a skill a, a, a trade to our kids and, and get a really good uh, living, uh, that would be it. Um, but we've never done that. Um, and, and we don't, you know, if we're really intentional, I know I used that word before, I'll use it again, about you know, so many of our kids are leaving school if they graduate and they find out that they're two years behind. And so many that don't graduate, that would be my focus is ensuring that every child is coming out of school with an education that's comparable to the region around us and and then they will have options in their lives to do a lot more things um, than we're giving them right now you know to be honest with you guys we will have to look in a lot of different policies that's that's with that you know the different because there's different approaches to that. We can go to them and say, hey, we want to do this. But if they don't want to, then it's time to relook at different options in the city of Hartford. Because again, our youth is much important. We have to invest in our youth. Our youth is the, is, is the today. And if we don't invest in them, who else is going to do what we're doing? Who else is going to speak out for us? You know, to answer that, yes, I would shut them down. If you don't want to invest, why are you here? So I, I would also uh, be in favor of shutting uh, the job down. But I, I think um, before that, I would require that the contracts be written so that shutting the job down for non-compliance would be permissible and um, hopefully would avoid any kind of 
uh, liability to the city. But in addition to enforcing such a clause in a contract, uh, I think we can also disqualify an offending company from any future contracts with the city. And hopefully that would be um, a deterrent for their noncompliance. Thank you. Next. I, hey, hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said here. I think we've got to be uh, aggressive with our enforcement on these project sites. But I, I also want to make that this uh, point. You know, as long as our conversation ends at how we enforce minority contracting standards, it, we're fighting over a sliver of the pie, a little piece of it. And we're going begging from people like Manafort Constructions. That's Donald Trump's Manafort, right? How long are we going to be begging for scraps from the table instead of building our own table in this city. And that's what I'm doing at the Land Bank. It's time for us to build our own table. All right, thank you. And now we're going to start with you, Mr. Runin, on this last question that came from the audience. Please speak briefly about your ideas about how we will bring back neighborhood schools. Let me preface that with people kind of understand now that busing has not worked for all our children, okay? And so what are you as mayor going to do to help bring back neighborhood schools, strong neighborhood schools that work for our children, all of our children? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to um, get into the, the uh, details of our neighborhood schools, and I, I know I have a minute. I, I want to say, uh, you know, I think we should start by turning them into community hubs again. You know, our neighborhood schools... Our neighborhood schools used to be open after the school day was over. And, and I would like to keep our neighborhood schools open to give kids a safe space to be kids again and then to rebuild sports and rec programs in those schools, to build music and the arts in each neighborhood, and to be, rebuild real, real in, engagement in our kids. I think by, by busing those kids who are going all over the state back into their neighborhoods again and creating a sense of identity in that neighborhood, it, it creates the impetus for people to start investing in their neighborhood schools again. Thank you. All right. I do think that uh, we were penny wise and pound foolish when we started uh, closing schools and eliminating recreation programs. I'm one that believes that we should take advantage of every opportunity to put uh, young people under the supervision of responsible adults so that mm -hmm. um, character building can occur, leadership uh, development can occur, life skills training can occur, respect for authority, respect for elders, respect for human life can occur uh, under those circumstances. So I agree with uh, Arunin that we should uh, do what we can to open up the schools. Uh, many people say that there are a handful of people that make uh, classrooms disruptive and uh, with the charter schools and the magnet schools um, claiming that they have the solution for uh, successful education, my, I would challenge them and say that they should take some of the disruptive students instead of the cream of the crop and see what they could do with the disruptive students. Okay. I would say, you know, we will have to, we're gonna have to revamp our school system because our school system has failing our, is failing our kids. We have a lot of kids who have dropped out of school. So, you know, we're gonna have to sit there and do the right thing what's best for the children. So what that means is bringing different programs back into the schools, you know, so many different schools have closed and we're crunching them in one big old building in the city of Hartford. We have all these different schools in one building. So now it's time to re-examine our school system, to rebuild our school system. There you go. go. <laughs> uh, while I certainly believe strongly in neighborhood schools, I, I'm not certain that that is uh, the answer. I think the answer is that we as a community, from the government, and we've ceded all of education to the school system. I think that's wrong. 
I think the city residents, the, 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 all hands on deck to say we have high expectations for our kids and we're not gonna accept anything less than that. And that means everybody being engaged in saying to parents, if you have high expectations of your child, that teacher's gonna have high expectations of that child. And that child will then have higher expectations of themselves. We're not doing that as a community. We have ceded all responsibility to the school system. That has to change. And whether that's in a neighborhood school or whether that's in a, a magnet school or whatever it might be, it's about expectations and then doing the work, doing the work so that child, look, think about yourself. If you were good at something, you wanted to do it. And if you weren't good at it, you didn't want to do it anymore. And um, we have to have it so that kids feel good about learning and that they want to uh, engage and succeed at it. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to rebuttal that. Like uh oh, rebuttal. please. Okay, wait, we're gonna let the, oh. No, he can go ahead. Okay, you can go ahead. You know, me being a single father in the city of Hartford, I literally had to bust my daughter out to Avon okay. to get a better education. Since she has been in Avon's um, radio magnet school, she has learned so much within two years of being in school. When she was in the city of Hartford, I couldn't get nothing from her. Nothing. I have fought, fought, fought. Our voice was not being heard. So okay. why is it that we have to bring our kids out? Thank you. All right. All right. Um, to answer that question, I've spoken to a lot of mothers um, that they school, their child is being bust out. All the children in the city of Hartford, I don't feel the need that they need to be bust out. We have three elementary schools here that are closed. Why are they closed? I know the reason why they closed. But they need to be open. We have Wish that turned into, no, that Wish is just closed because for whatever reason. Um, Waverly turned into a truck and parking lot. And Clark is closed. Um, supposedly some madness going on with that and some madness going on with Waverly, why they don't want to bother with opening it up because the city claims there's a ticket on it, price tag, that they don't want to get into, you know, doing what they need to do pretty Thank much you. to open it back up. Thank you. So I think the first way to start is to be educated and to be familiar with what is currently existing in the neighborhood school landscape. Right now, Milner is open. That is a program that I created. It provides access. There are 13 other schools that are open after school. Weekends, we have safe Saturdays where families come and eat and cook dinners and uh, paint, uh, paint days, should I say, and those type of activity activities so the schools are open. But what we have to do is to promote them and double down as, with intention. You know, right in this neighborhood, this neighborhood has the biggest education gap in the state. Then, in order to fix the problem, you close Wish, Clark, and Waverly. Okay, time. That's intentional. Thank you. Okay, now we're getting ready for the triple jeopardy. Okay, we've talked about public safety, fiscal income, job creation, crime, the school system, homelessness, housing, community involvement, and of course the airport. Now you have two minutes, and you're gonna be held to those two minutes to do closing remarks on what you would do when you become mayor. Oh, okay, all right, one minute, we're, we're a little short on time. Got, Ms. Gallant Clark looked at me, she said, one minute. Okay. <laughs> so what I will say is, what and what most of you have heard me say um, in my launch is the ability to do more with more. You know, I've had experience through all of my careers and all of my professions, Public Act 13178, that changed the children's behavioral health system that exists today. 
federal funding from SAMHSA that provided access opportunities for people all over the state. A community organizer that held a rally with over 10,000 people at the state capitol and forced Governor Malo Malloy to stop session so he could listen to us. Millions of dollars in investment in current opportunities that exist. Now imagine a future with me as your next mayor when I can do more with more. Thank you. Ms. Funny. If I was the elected mayor, just get the job done. <laughs> get the job done. It's an easy process. Get the job done. We hear the issues. We hear the problems. All we need to do is just come together, together. You know what I'm saying? Not just as a mayor, but together as a community. And just get the job done. Everybody have a place. Everybody has a place. Let's just come together and get the job done. Um, this will be a very, very difficult job. And um, I, I've decided to pursue this because as a state senator for the last 26 years, as much as I feel there's much has been done, not enough has been done in order to raise up our neighborhoods. The future of Hartford will be determined by the health, health of the residents of our city. And on average, the residents of our city's health is not good. And that means increasing incomes, improving dramatically uh, education, and investing in place so as people begin to do better in their world, in their life, they don't do what so many people do right now, which is to leave our city. They'll feel better about their neighborhood and want to invest in it and engage in it because they'll have more resources to do that. They'll feel better about their children and their education and being able to um, be an, an involved and engaged resident of their neighborhood. Thank you. You know, as your next mayor of Hartford, I will make sure that I put Hartford residents first. Put yo, you guys first, because without you guys, we're nothing. You know, again, my slogan is Hartford matters. How much do it matter to you? Are we ready to stop seeing the poverty in Hartford, are we stop ready to stop seeing the shootings, the different things? We have to come together as one. It's time to come together to make a brighter Hartford, a brighter future. It takes one day at a time, but if we all get up together, we can do it. It's time for Hartford to thrive. And I promise to get it done. Meet the people where they are. So I acquired a bit of experience during my time in the legislative arena, in the political arena. And during that time, I've answered to no one but the people. Uh, if you're one who feels that city government is not open enough, it's not inclusive enough, it's not accountable enough, and it's not transparent enough. I want you to know that help is on the way. All right. If you're a person and you feel that your Hartford neighborhood has not been invested enough, uh, there's not been any infrastructure improvement. There's not been any development opportunities uh, in your neighborhood. I want you to know, help is on the way. If you're like me and many, many other people and you're sick and tired of hearing about gun violence and young people shooting one another down, 
in the streets. Help is on the way, and that help is coming in the form of Eric D. Coleman as mayor of the city of Hartford. Look, we've had a long conversation tonight about all of the things that uh, folks might think are wrong about the city of Hartford or wrong in the city of Hartford. And I hope that all of you guys find, walk out of here with hope for the future of the city of Hartford because there's so much more, I think, that's right in our city. And the biggest thing is each and every one of you. You have so much power. You are such an integral part of our future. And this isn't about me or about anybody at this table. It's about what we can do together. I really believe in the future of Hartford because I believe in the future of each and every one of you and each of the beautiful children in our city, each of the people in our city, and, and what we can do if we can work together. There is so much power, so much talent, so much potential within each and every one of you, and I would love your help uh, in this campaign and down the road to build a brighter future. So thank you for your time. God bless you all. I appreciate, I appreciate this opportunity. We promise to get you out on a timely basis, so that's exactly what we're going to do. But before I do the thank yous, I want to say to the press, for the record, I understand that every single mic works, their voice activated. So don't let that be in the press that they, the mics didn't work. The mics do work, their voice activated. So I would like to thank, first of all, our moderator, attorney Cynthia Jennings. I would like to also thank each of our candidates. <laughs> Mr. Stan McCauley, who does what he does. I'd like to thank the BHCA staff, especially our timekeeper, Jody Ann. <laughs> But this is where I'm going to ask the candidates to stand up and give you a round of applause for being here. Yeah. Woo! Yes. Yes. As I mentioned before, as you see, the time goes by very quickly. That's why next month we're going to have a forum that deals just with public safety. We have to dig, get, dig deep and do a deep dive into that subject. So just with public safety, a lot of the cards that you submitted to Angela, we've categorized them and they will be presented at subsequent sessions. Last but not least, we started off with prayer. We're gonna end with prayer. And so we're gonna ask Pastor Zach if he can pray for safety as we go home. All right, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you we magnify you and we glorify you for this opportunity to share our concerns and to hear these our candidates. Now, God, as we leave this place, but never from your presence, protect us, keep us, and sustain us as we journey home. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of us and give us peace both now and forevermore. And if you believe it and receive it, shout with me. Amen. Amen. Amen.
My name is Jay Stan McCauley, and uh, I do business as Light Source Productions. I provide professional services in the area of strategic video communications. Uh, first, what we do is we help you craft your message by using what I call the rule of the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why. We do event documentation, uh, content acquisition, full-scale productions, um, editing, and of course, distribution uh, through our social media television network. And with social media, uh, video is more important now than it has ever been. Uh, whether you're talking big business, small business, nonprofit, church, or just an individual. Uh, let's say you, you know you you plan uh, uh, you're planning an event, a wedding, whatever the case may be. But but let's say a big event, uh, but no video. And you spend all this time, all these hours uh, to put this event on, and maybe a hundred, two hundred people attend the event. But more important than that is that thousands could attend by watching it on social media. But of course, you don't think about this until after the event is over. You can't afford not to capture it for social media. And despite what people think, I am affordable. Give me a call. Let's plan your next video project and share it with the world on my social media television network. I promise you that you will have the attention of one person, me.